Welcome to the Cooking with Without Cooking Cosmos. TV show, Lighthouse Guild Edition. Oops, I got a little problem here. It just uh, jumped up on me. My name is Alan Preston. <laughs> well, at least you're cheery. <laughs> My name is Annette Watkins. It's so good to be back, Alan. You know, the summer really whizzed by this year. It sure did. Hey, you had your kitchen redone. How did it turn out? Okay, that's a sore spot. No, not really. It, it was a sore spot going through it. it. seemed very long, but it's done and it's beautiful. And it, everybody said it'll be worth it. And it is worth it. I'm very, very grateful and thankful. And I'll have to show you it sometime when I cook on the show. Love to see it. Well, today we're in the kitchen of the Lighthouse Guild in New York City. And... You're in New York City. I thought you were in West Palm Beach. No, no, no. I am in West Palm Beach, Florida. That's right. Our cooks today are in New York. No, I'm just kidding. You. <laughs> you know, when I heard we were going to be in New York City, I thought that was going to be really cool because I love New York. It's a special place. And we have two special people with us today. We're going to meet Kathy Phillips and Laura Good. They're going to be preparing their fried chicken and their apple crisp. Mm, that sounds good. Dinner and and dessert at the same time. I love it. Yes, that's going to happen today, Alan. So you're in your, your zone today. And on Food for Thought, um, I'm going to be speaking with um, Dara Sella. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Deidre, excuse me, Deidre yeah. Sella. She is a longtime... Uh, case manager for over 30 years in rehabilitation services at the Lighthouse Guild in New York. And just a reminder, everyone on our Cooking Without Looking TV show and podcast is either blind or, severe, or partially sighted, severely visually impaired, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I love it. I love the way you're always up and cheery, no matter what. This show's done live, so anything can happen. So let's start and kick it off Cooking Without Looking TV show, Lighthouse Guild edition. The Lighthouse Guild is dedicated to providing exceptional services that inspire people who are visually impaired to attain their goals. One of these people is Kathy Phillips. Now, Kathy has been receiving services from the Lighthouse Guild since 2020, including orientation and mobility training, to help her navigate the world around her and independent living skills that help her with meal management, financial management, and caring for her home. Kathy, welcome. Hi, welcome. I'm glad to be here. Well, Kathy, we're very happy to have you with us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey through blindness? Well, Yes, um, I became legally blind in 2013. I actually came to the Lighthouse Guild at that time um, seeking services and they led me on the way to becoming a little more comfortable with a very difficult and quick changing atmosphere in my life. Um, at first it was a little nerve shaking in the sense that I believed that there was nothing I could do anymore. Um, I, everything I loved, I couldn't do. And as time went on, those things have been proven differently and mostly wrong. Um, and they give you hope and the desire to always learn something and to be able to adapt not just what you knew before, but to adapt it in the way that you have to do it now, which is mostly safer and easier. Uh, Kathy, can you what caused your blindness? I'm sorry? What was it that caused your blindness? Oh, okay, I am a diabetic. Like it happened very suddenly, you said. <laughs> yes, I, I was a diabetic and still am. Um, I was diagnosed in uh, 1999. And at that time, doctors only concentrated, it seems to me, on amputations. They did not 
throw in there that it caused other things to happen to you as well. So I was fine because, you know, I, you do all the things to keep your body clean and you do things not to hurt yourself so that, so amputations, I'm not worried about that. Well, um, I started having fuzzy visions and it was we did cataract first. And then as time progressed, I noticed that I, like it was blackout spells. I couldn't see anything at all. And what happened was the diabetes had started um, working on my eyes. And that caused uh, at first just poor vision, then it got worse and worse. And then there was operations in between and um, here I am, um, no vision at all in the left side and partial in the right. Wow, that was <laughs> some experience. So I guess uh, uh, take heed all people that are borderline diabetics like myself, take good care of yourself and your eyes. Although, well, I guess I could lose more of my sight. I still have a little left. Anyways. What are we preparing? What are you preparing for us today, Kathy? Well, I'm going to stand if you don't mind. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, it's apple crisp, i.e. apple. So, of course, there's an ingredient of an apple. I have uh, sugar. And I have uh, a flour com com combination thing. And some utensils. Oh, besides that, butter, egg, and cinnamon. So there's only like six ingredients, which is good for me. And <laughs> yes, I won't forget anything, hopefully. So we have measuring cups, a scooper to take out the middle of the apple. And there's a knife that's got rigid edges for cutting and also a peeler. A pillar is easier to do an apple with than the knife as far as peeling it itself. Okay. So, should I continue? Please do. Have you measured all of your ingredients? Um, they're pre done the um, flour and cinnamon combination in this bowl. Mm -hmm. And I have a bowl I'm not going to pick up right now. It has butter in it that's melted. And sliced apples have cinnamon on top of them already sprinkled and saturated. And oh, a really great thing I learned about was measuring spools that are bent so that when you're dipping a liquid, it's easier to stay in there and you don't have to mess too much. And you just dip and pick up. Oh, I like that. I, I thought that was really neat. Yeah. Those are pretty cool, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yes. So why did you pick this recipe? It sounds delicious. I bet yeah. it's gonna smell great too. Well, actually, I didn't personally pick it, but it is a nice thing because I love apples. Oh, okay. And um, it's something that's I feel it's a little bit comfortable for a person that doesn't really cook that often, especially dessert things. Right. So I'm pleased about it in that angle and the apples are sliced and cinnamon all sprinkled on it and sugar. So that's really good. And I'm ready. So, so what I'm going to do now the apples, I don't know if you can see them, they're nicely sliced with that. I'm gonna sprinkle the flour and cinnamon compost here. And we're using a, like a grid, kind of, you know, crumb it up a little bit. And we're gonna go across first. I don't know if I can see how to do that. We're going across and it's going to be top, middle, bottom, and then we're gonna go down like a grid. So it's gonna look like the, the mat, little, little squares with holes. And 
Once that's put on, we're gonna drizzle the butter. I'm just gonna stir it a little bit, get consistency. So as you see, it holds it really neat. So all I gotta do is flip it over. And I'm gonna do a few spoons of this, okay? I think that should be suffice. We don't have to use all of it. Uh, Kathy, I'm a little curious. Are you working over a tray? Uh, yes, yes I am. Is okay, a I, that's a real good idea. Side. I I do that too. I spill things. It's a lot easier to clean up. And there's a mat inside which kind of keeps the pan from moving about or the bowl. So that's really good. Yes. And so basically, all the ingredients are in the pan. The mixture of the flour and sugar and cinnamon is over it, and the butter has been drizzled. And it's ready to go into the oven. What has been in your oven? Into the oven. Goes in no, the you, oven. You have preheated the oven to what? The oven should be preheated, I think, around 350, 325, somewhere around there. Just um, it just takes and in the heat, it'll just, you know, hold everything together. It is stuck right. together. The apples will get cooked and the flavoring will go through it and gets brown on the top and you're ready to enjoy for dessert, not for the dip. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I'm curious about a couple of little things. I, I can't see what's going on on the screen. I can barely see my script here. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you know, don't have to be sorry about it all, it's no problem. Um, but do you have your oven marked so that you know where the temperatures are with little funny dots on them? Uh, yes, at home I have the, at the, the most setting that I would use for the things I put in the oven. So there's a dot there and then there's the dot where, should, where I should be able to uh, fill for the off. Okay, yeah, my, my I do something very similar. I have 350 and 400 marked, and 375 is very common and easy to find. But my off is a little click in the knob itself, so I don't need to worry about that. That's uh, some good tips. And I like those little spoons. Um, yeah, these are great. I was just okay. introduced. And, uh, okay, so now you've got it in the oven. How long do you leave it in there? Well, about 30 minutes. If it's not brown enough for you, you might want to keep it maybe a couple more, but not too much because you don't want it to be over brown. Um, can over. you tell? Is it is it by time or can you? Um, usually, well, usually there are smells when you're baking things and they get to a done consistency. The apples become, and you can smell more of the ingredients that way. Um, only thing I can say as far as the top part with the crumbs, that, that unfortunately you would have to just lightly fill to see like, is it still, you know, like raw and crumbled like that or is there another texture to it? Okay. Now, uh, Kathy, have you got one that's already been? Uh, yes, we do. We have it prepared. So I had a feeling yeah, you did. I'm see <laughs> here and, yeah. okay. and also, it's heavier than the unbaked one. I don't know if you can see this or not, but it's nice and brown and all ready to share. I bet that smells wonderful, too. Mm -hmm. Hot, of course. Okay, so with that, that's the apple crisp. This sounds pretty easy. Have you ever made it for anybody? Uh, I know, but after today, family? I'm definitely <laughs> going to make it for my friends and I can cube oh, it, good. wrap it up and share it. Excellent. That is wonderful. So we, you showed us the finished product and you uh, made the whole recipe. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kathy, for doing yeah, nice. that. I know it's not easy to be on screen, but you did wonderful. Thank, oh, thank you. you.
Thank yes, you. Kathy, thank you very much. And I know that the recipe will be available uh, on our website. We'll get to that in just a little minute, in just a minute here. But uh, Annette. Yes, sir. Yeah, Alan, um, now we're gonna meet Laura Good. Okay. And if her name, her name has anything to do with this, this recipe is gonna be amazingly good. And uh, she's been receiving services from the Lighthouse Guild in New York since about 2017, and including living skills that help her with managing things in the home and financial management as well. Um, Laura, how are you today? Laura, are you there? Come in. Laura? Yes. Hi, sweetie. I can't see you right now, but I hear you. Um, Laura, it's great to have you with us. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your blindness journey and how you became, um, are you totally blind or are you visually impaired? Totally, totally blind. Tell us a little bit about that journey. What has that been like for you? What caused your blindness and anything else you want to tell us about yourself? Okay, um, my name is Laura Good. Uh, I started losing my vision. Um, uh, must have been in 2002. Mm -hmm. 2002, I think it was, somewhere in that area. 2002, 2003. Uh, so I went to many, many doctors and had several surgeries. But, and um, I had glaucoma. I lost my vision to glaucoma. Mm -hmm. uh, several um, surgeries but in, none of them seemed to work. Uh, my doctor said that glaucoma were uh, just rude and ugly and, and especially hot and worse in African-American people, uh, hard to stop, so. Is that right? It's more progressive in, in African-American? Huh? It's more progressive, more aggressive as well? Yes, yes, so. Um, with all of the surgeries and everything, but finally in, in, in 2013, I lost my vision completely. Um, but you know what happened? I lost a uh, physical vision, but I have a spiritual uh, vision that keeps me going. Exactly. And, yes, to God be the glory. Uh, and I'm grateful, grateful to be here today. Um, yes. Uh, and thanking Diane for Think it of me to tell me to come to be on on this training of show. Um, yeah, we're we're glad you're here, and we're glad you you have a terrific attitude about it. Because being that you had um, your vision before, I'm sure you're able, of course, able to visualize a lot of things that you've experienced your whole life. Yes. yes. So yes. you've been able to adapt a little bit easier, perhaps. Oh yes, much easier. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So what are you making for us today, Laura? Today, I'm going to make fried chicken. Fried mm. chicken. Everybody loves chicken. I oh, do. Popeyes, every... I like. I'll see if I like yours. I'm sorry? I said I love Popeyes chicken. I'm sure I'll love yours. Yes. You're going to love mine. Believe <laughs> me. Believe okay. Me. So go ahead and, and get started on that and uh, take it away. Right. My chicken is very... The uh, recipe is very easy. There's only three uh, ingredients. First, you got your chicken. Um, then you have your mayo. And then uh, you have um, your cornflakes. Uh, the chicken, you season it to taste. Everybody likes fried chicken, but then it has to be seasoned to taste. Mm. And what is your opinion? What is your opinion, season to taste? What is your what seasonings do you use that makes it taste so good? Well, we need, we need just a dab of salt, not too much, just a dab of salt, and uh, black pepper, and maybe um, uh, fl uh, uh, flour, um, and um, some thyme, and you know, just crumb it up, whatever. But here today, I only have the uh, uh, the, the mayo and the crumb. Mm -hmm. Well, mayo has a lot of flavoring as it is. So there you go. There you go. So it mayo, makes everything putting the, stick. putting the mayo on it doesn't. This way, you don't have to use all the other seasoning. You just right. Mayo, okay. So I, I have the, I have the chicken here, um, already seasoned, 
with the, with the season. So now just take the chicken, a piece of chicken and put it into the uh, mayo and make sure that the mayo is covered the entire part of the chicken evenly, evenly. And once you do that on both sides, uh, then you would dip it into your um, cornflakes, right? And now let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. You're using yeah. cornflakes, Laura. Now, what if someone doesn't have that? Could they use breadcrumbs? Oh yeah, or, yeah. or pretzels? How about pretzels? Pretzels. I never use pretzels, but that's a good idea. It, it might be even better. I never really used the pretzel. Well, just in case you don't have the ingredient at home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pretzel sounds great. Okay, okay but cornflakes seem to be able to stick better though. I know they seem like they would stick very well. Yeah. Okay, so now this piece of chicken here is, is sauteed very well into, in, the, in the mayo. So now I'm going to dip, dip it into the um, cornflake crumbs all over so that when it's done, it's going to be crunchy and delicious. Mm. <laughs> I like the sound effects there. Okay, and once you got your chicken seasoned, you put it into, saute it into your mayo, and then from the mayo to the, to the uh, um, cornflake crumbs, and then you place it on the cookie sheet. But mm -hmm. on the cookie sheet, there's also a, a rack, a baker's rack, rack. So, and then, and you need to put it on the rack so that the, the chicken doesn't get soggy. We don't want soggy chicken. We want no. juicy we fried chicken. Don't want okay. soggy chicken. We want crispy chicken. Right. On this side? Yes. Okay. So now I'm going to place this piece of chicken on the baker's rack so that it can be cooked nice and juicy. And, all right. Do I have another piece? Just one piece. Okay. All right. So in a few minutes, we should be able to have um, juicy, crispy fried chicken. Why don't see you frying anything? I'm sorry. Are you frying anything? Maybe I'm oven fried. Oven. I'm gonna, we're gonna put it in the oven. Right. Oh. We're gonna put it in the oven at. Uh, Heat the oven, preheat the oven for 360. 360, uh -huh. 360, 360, 360. And right. then, right, we're gonna put the chicken in and we're gonna leave it in for approximately 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and it should be ready, it should be ready at that time after 30 minutes. So that's that's a good thing because it's a lot healthier then because you're not frying in oil. I thought this was really gonna be, you know, fried in oil, but it's gonna have the flavor without the um you know the cholesterol or the you know oil and all that in it i'm sorry would you say chicken that? with the flavor of fried? yeah chicken with the flavor without all the oil without frying it yeah yes yes that's wonderful yeah. yes wonderful and it's and it's very quick very quick you know sometimes you're hungry and you want to eat something very fast and good so you just grab this chicken and and uh, oven fried just like in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, I like that a lot. Well, give us any tips. Do you have any tips for a for cooking? Any other tips that you've experienced over the years? I, let me just clarify. How long have you been um, blind, totally blind, Laura? Since, since 2013. Okay, 2013. Mm -hmm. So what have you learned in the kitchen that's really helped you? I'm sure at first it was a little definitely difficult to get comfortable in the kitchen. What, what, what did I learn? Yeah, what have you um, learned since the beginning to now that has made you feel so comfortable in the kitchen? Oh, well, I came to, came to the lighthouse and um, at the lighthouse I was taught many different things, how to do grilled cheese and what have you and and meeting the other people, uh, which was a blessing. Uh, 
learning that. And then they gave me all of the uh, uh, utensils that I needed, the gloves and everything. And then they came to my home and put the dots from my oven to, to, mm -hmm. so that I would um, you know, know how to turn the oven on and how to turn it off and, and, and a dot for 360 and what have you. And it gave me, gave me courage. Because see, that's all I really needed was a little bit of courage to say that, oh, I can do this, even though, even though I can't see, but I can see. So I can, I can do this. And um, after coming to the lighthouse, it gave me, it gave me all the courage that I needed. That's great. You needed the support. You need the community support and you got it from the Lighthouse Guild in New York. Yes. And I'm sure you made friends and met other people that were in the same situation that had encouraged you and supported you as well. Yes. Yes. That's fantastic. Yes. Well, and, and now I say to my, my, my daughter, my children, my grandchildren, my great grands and my great great grands. Wow. <laughs> you, guys don't have to come, you guys don't have to come and um, fix nothing for me to eat. I can fix it myself. Wow. That's good. You're independent now. Yes. You have a great inspirational. Time. Yes. Yeah. Very inspirational. Now, did you want to show us the finished product on the screen? Maybe hold up the rack or anything, or do you have a finished product with you? This is the finished product right here. Doesn't, okay. that, look, doesn't that look delicious? Can you see it? I can't see it right now, but <laughs> Alan, can you see it? <laughs> Fortunately, I can't either. I, I'm waiting for smell of vision at least. Yeah, just hold it up a little. Yeah, yeah, hold. I, yeah, yeah I, I don't know where, where, where we're at. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Renee. Yeah, hold it up and let us know when she put well, it down. Laura, hold it up a little, like to you, to your elbows. Are you a little further up? A little further up. There you go. Can you see it now? Yes. yes, Renee, you can see it, right? Yes, yes, I yeah, can see good. it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Laura. Looks Thank you so much up. for okay. being with us. Thank you You're for welcome. cooking and putting everything together and sharing your story with us today. Okay. Thank you for having me. Yes, come back and see us, please. Thank yes, you. Laura. Thank you very much for your for, for your wonderful chicken recipe. I like that. Well, now in that. We have Deidre Sal Sala. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Deidre. And yes, Deidre is manager at the Lighthouse Guild. Yes, Deidre. I love that name. That's a beautiful name, Deidre. How are you? Welcome. I am well. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So excited. Good. I'm happy that you're happy. It's so good to meet you today. Um, I want you to tell us a little bit um, about yourself and what you do at the Lighthouse. Um, I know you've been with the Guild for over 30 years and um, that you're um, the case manager, yes. case manager for the rehabilitation. So um, over the years, tell us a little bit about that, about yourself and, and what you're um, doing over there at the Lighthouse. So we are, I would like to say like this, here at the Lighthouse, we are changing lives. We are making what can be a horrible situation of somebody losing their vision to bring light to their situation. So we go in the field, we go visit our clients, we go to the home to assess how we can better help them, whether it's managing a meal, managing the home, managing finances, whatever their daily need is, we come up with a solution. Every individual is treated in such a way that they have something specifically for them, tailored for them, tailored for their vision. And so we have the opportunity to go into the homes and meet these people one-on-one, -on -one, which is just a joy by itself. Yes, that's a joy because you going into their specific home, you cater everything to their needs, their particular yes. needs. So over the years, what cooking tips have you um, found to be very useful for um, for your blind and visually impaired clients? The truth of the matter is we should all, sighted, partially sighted, and no sight at all, the techniques that we teach here are universal. It's all about safety first. Closing the cabinet. Organization is key. Putting all your products out at one time so you're not going to the cabinet. You're not running to the refrigerator. So you want to organize 
before you even begin the task. So this way it's not a daunting task, but you want to keep the joy in cooking. Mm -hmm. And so organization is key. So that's why you see the trays here with all the ingredients, all the things that you would need for that specific thing that you're going to be cooking. Mm -hmm. And it makes life a lot easier. Yes, it sure does. You're right, though. I mean, everybody could use those tactics, especially. I'm Absolutely. not going to say that I might, you know, tell ruffle, on yourself. Come I on. might ruffle some feathers, but men need this class. <laughs> men that don't cook yeah. are scared of the kids. I don't know how Alan's going to feel about that one, but go ahead. <laughs> I'm an old high school shop teacher, and I believe there's a place for everything, and everything should be in its place. Measuring, laying things up, not only does it work for cooking, but it works for fixing your car, too. You go, Alan. That's right. You tell her. <laughs> yes, tell me. That's it. I just oh, yeah, it's <laughs> universal. It really has yeah. nothing to do with the vision, but what we do teach, it will carry no matter where the person's vision is at the time. The tech right. will always carry. Okay, great. So when I label my spices alphabetically, that's okay. It's not considered anal. Or not at all, because I do the same thing. If you go to my cabinets, they look the same way, even my closet. I mean, we get so in depth, people's clothing. We separate winter, spring, summer, and fall. We go in there and whatever their need is, and sometimes that is a need. And so there's a little bit of OCD in all of us, but it works. That, that's, that's true. And that's funny. That sounds like a good Netflix show. <laughs> Uh, I'm, on it. I'm, I'm hoping to get something out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Key is organization. I'm sure. Organization. Are they a little resistant at first because you're changing everything up? Does it take them a while to get used to it or do they? It you know, does. It yeah. For some people, because they're very apprehensive and you know, what us coming to people home sometimes they don't know what to expect. Hmm. And so we like to keep people guard down. I think the staff here, they're very loving and we just have a handle on people because this job is all about people. And yeah. so even though there is a vision loss, there is always a caring hand to let people know that we're here for you. And so once you get past that barrier, because sometimes we are the first people in that actually tell somebody that they've been diagnosed legally blind. And so there has been some stories where we have to share and, you know, break that news mm -hmm. to the person. Um, but once they get their feet wet and then we begin to show them all the things and to let them know and assure them that we're there for them, they're all in. Mm, I see. Now, what part of New York exactly are you located? So the Gill is, is located in Manhattan, but we as case managers, we cover all the boroughs. All the, all the five. Okay. All the boroughs, yeah. So you, you travel around. Now, how much time? I'm sorry, go ahead. How much time? Oh, lots how, of how time. How much time would you spend with one person so they actually get it? I mean, if every individual is different. We believe as long as it takes that they're comfortable mm -hmm. in what they need to do. Mm, very good. And these are all free services to them? Absolutely. Wow. That is the best part. That is the best part. And so you know, to know that there's a service. And I always share a story of how I even got started working with people that are visually impaired. My great grandmother was blind. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. And she didn't have an agency like the Lighthouse coming in. So I do share that story with consumers where you can be empathetic and not feel sympathetic towards people, but empathy is what people are looking for. And I find that people are looking more to talk to somebody who understands what they're going through. Right, okay. You don't want to feel sorry for them, but you wanna- you But we need to let them know that you can still do it. You're more than a set of eyes is what I always tell people. You are a whole person. Wow, you are a sweetheart. I'd love to work with you. <laughs> I'm here, I'm from the Florida. <laughs> I'm from New York, does that count? Okay. Oh, sure. <laughs> we neighbors, I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> I'm a little bit curious. Uh, New York's a big city. How many people a year do you serve? Oh, if I have to tell you, I have to come to your house and, and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> um, normally in a year, um, yeah. there are three case managers. And I would say in a year, we cover maybe 600 plus people. Wow. On foot. Yes. Unbelievable. 
Yeah. You know, the mayor of New York was blind for like three weeks. I don't know if Eric Adams rings a bell. I know he's their mayor oh, sure. right now. Yeah. But I read his book. He, he turned vegan. He lost tons of weight. He, he lost his eyesight due to diabetes for about three weeks. Wow. Yeah. Then he got it back. He, he didn't come through your system. Probably not. But, we could have uh, helped him though. Yeah. He's okay. We would have had him right. He would have been ready. Yeah. He would have been, but thank God he got his sight back. So what would you give? What kind of advice would you give someone who is going blind or, you know, they just newly been diagnosed? What kind of advice? You already mentioned a little bit about it, but just reiterate what advice you would give to someone who is going blind, yeah. but they may be um, somewhat nervous about right. starting this new life. Mm -hmm. to seek help. The advice that I would always give people is, don't be afraid to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And what I do tell people is this. Uh, one thing we all have in common, sickness does not discriminate. And so we don't know what life will ever deal us. None of us ever knows. And so always be ready to just ask for help. We all need help. We are not meant to live this life by ourselves and figure it out. We are all still trying to figure this thing called life out with the ups and downs, the ends and the outs, the sickness and all those things that come with life. It happens right. and that nobody is exempt, but we're all here to help, but we have to ask for help. And sometimes I see family members that um, because their children live away and things like that, they don't wanna tell them because they don't wanna be a burden mm -hmm. to their children. Right. I take these life lessons now that I get and I hear from the people that I meet and that I see and I go home and I talk to my kids and I let them know no matter what, if I need help, I need you to be there and I'm not going to be ashamed and it's nothing to be ashamed about. It happens. Mm -hmm. But to always reach out and let people know and I always tell my clients that, you know, you become an educator yourself. Because not everybody understands. If I look at some people that are visually impaired, I can't look at you and tell that there's something wrong with your vision. And family members don't understand that there's different levels to this thing. It's like an onion, it's layered. Right. And so family members become educators to let their family members know exactly what's going on and what they're seeing. So I found with the job that family members do become more involved uh, with their parents and relatives that are going through. And I think COVID taught a real lesson to a lot of us because we were doing things online. We had never done that before. And some family members didn't even understand what we really did. And they thought it was really cool, but they never knew until COVID happened. So right. it became an eye opener and a game changer for a lot of people. Right, because you did a lot of training online. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have family members on their phones and on their iPads, showing them how to set watches and clocks and all those things. Very interesting. So, yeah, well, there was a lot of positive that came out of COVID. Absolutely. You, know, you always have to look for the silver lining and you definitely. That's what it's all about. Here at the Gill, our glass is always half full and never empty. That's right. the motto. It's how you look at it. Right. I always kind of like to think that God gave me a very unique opportunity to see this world the way that very few other people get to see it. And it's a very unique place when you look at it from our perspective, isn't it? I agree. I absolutely agree with you. And like Laura said earlier, she's, she has two sets of eyes, her natural eyes and her spiritual eyes. I, I have a running joke. I tell people you have 20-20 and you see nothing. Because when you don't see anything, you don't even see what's going on around you. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. I'm curious, just out of the 600, off the top of your head, what percentage of those people have guide dogs and which percentage have canes? And then there, I guess there's another percent that's visually impaired that okay. don't have. So a lot of people that we see, so we see people uh, 55 and up. So this particular program is based on the older clients that we see. Um, uh, maybe 6%, maybe 5% have dogs. And maybe I would say 40 to 50% have canes. And so the cane is very tricky for a lot of people. It's not that they don't want it. Well, we do run into some areas of vanity, but then it's about safety. 
Mm. It's not that they don't feel safe. It's maybe the neighborhood that they live in that we have to take all that in account. But what we do for people who don't want to train in their neighborhood uh, for mobility, we will meet them. The mobility instructor will meet them to a better neighborhood, so to speak, that they will take them out just to get those tidbits that they need. Hmm. Interesting. So a lot of them have what they call cane shame. I heard that on one of um, Cooking Without Looking podcast. Oh, that's the first time I heard that. Okay. Yeah, that was on the podcast that um, Renee did for the Cooking Without Looking show. Uh -huh. uh, brought it up about having cane shame and she had to get over that. Yeah. And I tell people, first of all, it's about safety. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the key. It's safety. Right. Safety okay. first. So safety that's what we like to preach to our clients, even in the kitchen, is safety first. Always. Yeah. yeah. So do you have anything else you want to add before we close? We thank you so much for being here today. It were inspiration and very informative. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I just want to say thank you for being that voice. I actually started watching a bunch of your videos, mm -hmm. um, and I think they're really cool. So Great. I hope the best for you guys that uh, this awareness will bring people more to the forefront. And to let you know, you have a team here in New York City that are willing to jump on board with you guys on this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And if you have any, anytime you want to use these videos for teaching in any capacity, please feel free. A lot of people have done it. Over 40 uh, different countries have used the videos for teaching. So awesome. keep that in mind. Yeah, thank you so much. Alan, do you want to add anything? Uh that was absolutely excellent, Deidre. I'm very happy for the services you provide for those people up there. You're doing a great job. Thank you. And thank all of you for joining us on this Lighthouse edition of Cooking Without Looking TV show. If you would like any of today's recipes, I'll tell you what, they both sounded great. <laughs> Go to our website at www.cookingwithoutlookingtv dot wordpress.com let me do that one more time www dot cooking without looking tv dot wordpress dot com Annette yeah, I'm sure there were a couple smirks when they heard Cooking Without Looking, such a cute name. But if you'd like to enjoy today's show further and other shows, please go to our YouTube channel. If you are a teacher of people who are blind or visually impaired, as Annette said just a few minutes ago, please feel free to use our show for your students as many around the world, around the country, and more than 50 other countries around the world have also done. Yes, and check out our Cooking Without Looking podcast, anywhere you get your favorite podcast, and also on Alexa-enabled devices. Alan? And if you would like to donate to our Vision World Foundation, which is the one that kind of puts this together, to help us change the way we see blindness, please go to our website at www.cookingwithoutlookingtv.wordpress.com and click on the link right at the top of the page. For more information, please call area code 305-200-9100. Okay, and look for our next show. Don't forget, put it on your calendar or speak it into your phone. Our next show is Friday, October 15th, 14th, excuse me, at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And also, if there's anyone who wants to um, cook on that show, please call Renee at the phone number that was given. Given We're going to be in um, St. Vincent's Island. Not sure where that is. Oh, that we'll find like out fun. more. I'm not sure either. Yeah. I on like behalf of island excursions, they were fun. Yeah, I know you did. On behalf of Alan Preston and the Cooking Without Looking show and myself, we want to thank you so much for joining us and I want to say bye for now and have a fantastic weekend. Bye. bye.